What's good, guys? Welcome to my channel, where I help you to love the scriptures and to reform to the word of God. And as you guys can see, we got a special guest, my brother, Hector. Um, Hector, introduce yourself to the people, what you're about, what you do on TikTok and your ministry and all that stuff. Sure. Like you said, my name is Hector, and uh, people know me on the internet as uh, Theology Spoon. And simply what I do is I listen to lectures and sermons, and I get the most insightful part, and I make maybe a video 30 to 60 seconds long, and I put a music behind it, and I listen to it throughout the day, and it's worked out pretty good for a lot of people. And we cover many topics from, you know, the doctrines of faith, church history, heresies. We, we, we get busy on TikTok, yeah? Yeah, sir, we really do be getting busy on TikTok. And it's amazing the community that we have built on TikTok, a reformed community um, where we, we, we preach the word of God, we preach the doctrines of grace, and we, we, we're basically theology police because there's so much things going on in TikTok, and it's just so, so much heresy. And just so much young people with zeal as well who are preaching the gospel, but they're getting a lot of things wrong, and we're, we're here to try to correct them in love. Um, but yeah, it's good to have you on, my brother. Um, we, as you guys know, we're in a five-part series titled, What is Calvinism? Um, I did the first video by myself, Total Depravity. And then we had our brother Elijah Lamb come on to talk about irresistible grace. And then we have our brother Joshua who came on um, to talk about unconditional election and limited atonement. And for this last part, um, not the last part, but we're going to do another video. But for the, to end the acronym TULIP, we have our brother Hector to talk about the perseverance of the saints. Um, basically, the teaching is that if you are a Christian and you are saved by God, you will persevere to the end. Um, another term we like to use is the preservation of the saints because some people can get confused and think that your perseverance is all dependent on you. But we like to say the preservation of the saints sometimes because it shows us that God is the one who is preserving us. Um, I, I'm pretty sure my brother is going to talk about that. But in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, it says, And I am sure of this, that he, God, who began a good work in you, will bring it to completion. He's preserving you, and he's going to bring it to completion. Um, and I'm pretty sure he's going to bring that up. Um, so, yeah, the floor is yours, my brother. Yeah, um, so like you said, brother, uh, the letter P is the last letter in the acronym of TULIP. And I like this letter a lot. It's one of my favorites. But we do have to make that distinction at first before we talk yeah. about this for the sake of the viewers. And that way we lay out any confusion on why do we, what do we mean by the perseverance of the saints? And like you said, and R.C. and Alistair Beck and many other would agree with us, and that is that we believe that that term can be misleading to some. Um, a perfect example of this is limited atonement. Um, the mm -hmm. term is not bad within itself, but the word definite atonement helps us understand easier what we're trying to say. And the same thing happens here with um, the perseverance of the saints. We like to use the word preservation because salvation is a monergistic word and the Lord is literally preserving his people. Um, the Bible talks about that the work that he began in you, he will perfect it. And the Bible also talks about that he's the author of your faith. And it, it, he also becomes the redeemer and the perfecter of your faith. Yeah. Um, so one thing that is really interesting, um, we'll talk about that a little bit later, that is that when you study the preservation of the saints or the perseverance of the saints the one thing that will always emerge is uh synergism and monergism for the reason being is that if you believe in a synergistic salvation mm -hmm. then of course um salvation is about two active agents and yeah. there's a corporate cooperation between god and you and of course if that's the term you will lose your salvation but that's not what we're talking yeah. about today yeah, and that's very true. Like you said, if it's a synergistic work, there's two active agents. Um, it's not fully dependent on God. It depends on you and God um, yes. for you to continue in the faith. Um, so my right. one, one, one question I have for you, though, is can you, can you break down one common objection? And I'm going to give it to you right now because when people hear the perseverance of the saints, or once saved, always saved, 
um, uh, objecting they like to use is, oh, so you're telling me that you can be saved and live like a devil and stay saved because you had a profession of faith? And that's yeah. an objection I hear all the time when I ever I say, oh, the preservation or the perseverance of the saints or once saved, always saved. So how do you answer that? Well, first, um, we'll go with what Jesus said. Um, let's, let's, talk, let's start with Jesus and let's align the New Testament from beginning to end. Um, Jesus in the Gospels will clearly tell you, you're either part of my sheep or you're not. Um, and, and that's something, a clear distinction that we have to make. Um, and Jesus is also clear that a lot of people make a profession of faith, but they don't have that faith. Um, a perfect example is when people would go to heaven and, uh, as he was finishing the Sermon on the Mount. He said, um, depart from me, you doers of iniquity. I never knew you. He doesn't say, I knew you, but now I don't. Um, you decided to go your own way, so now I don't know you. No, he said he never knew you. And John, in, in, in his first epistle, he would say the same thing. He would say, yeah. those that departed from us were never part of us. So it's clearly in the New Testament that you can make a profession of faith, but that doesn't mean that you have that faith. Yeah, and like you said, with the first John um, uh, quote, the text says that if you left the faith, that's evidence that you weren't truly in the faith. So the yeah. common objection is, what about my grandma or my grandpa or my dad who came to church with me every Sunday, who was a Christian every Sunday, but he so happened to leave the faith? And that's an objection I actually got, is that they were telling me that their family yeah. member who was a Christian, he left the faith. So it's proof that you can lose your salvation. But John answered this question perfectly for us, yeah. that if you are truly in the faith, you yeah. will persevere to the end. Mm -hmm. If you don't persevere to the end, it's evidence that you were never saved to begin with. Matthew 7, like you said, I never knew you. He didn't say I knew you, but then I just stopped knowing you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, if you so yeah. happen to leave the faith, that's, that's evidence that you were never saved. And the reason why is because Ephesians 1.13 says, in him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in it, yeah. you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. You were yeah. sealed. Yeah. So the question is, can, who can break God's seal? Can we break God's seal? Absolutely not. Exactly. And when you are sealed by the Holy Spirit, yeah. you are going to remain sealed, and he's going to finish the work in you. So if you left the faith, that means you were never sealed. Because if you were sealed, you would have been, you would remain in Christ. Um, so, Yeah. Yeah, and, and another thing that I want to add, it's, it's not like we're not saying that the saints cannot commit sin, nor that they cannot fall into serious sin. We, of course, can. And that's why church discipline, that's why I asked you earlier, that's why church discipline is so important, because um, the point of church discipline is to do it in the hopes that the brother may come back. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we can take an example, David. King David made a serious sin. Not only did he commit adultery, but he also plotted out to murder um, his lover's uh, husband. Um, we can also see Peter. Peter betrayed Jesus, but he returned to the brethren and, and helped them. So we do see that people can fall in a state of sin yeah. and they can fall into sin, but it's never a, and I have, I have a quote right here, a Christian can fall into serious sin, but it's not a definite fall. Peter denied the Lord, and he repented. That's a well way to explain it. Yeah, I like that. because, And it's good that you brought up church discipline, because you even see that in 1 Corinthians, I believe, chapter 5, mm -hmm. where it was a dude who slept with his stepmom. And he told, they told him, um, Paul told them to excommunicate him, like literally, the, what he said, the phrase was literally hand him over to Satan yeah. so that he can be disciplined. But the yeah. point of that, the reason why he did that was that because if, if he was a true believer, he was going to come back. And we yeah. see that he does come back in 2 Corinthians. And in yeah. 2 Corinthians, I believe chapter 2, that they did so well and they went so extra in excommunicating this guy and handing him over to Satan. Paul had to write another letter telling them, all right, guys, enough is enough. Bring him back. Yeah. Because he wants yeah. to come back, but you guys are yeah. tripping now. So it's his yeah. time to come back because he's a genuine believer because he came back to the faith and he wants to be part of the community again. So yeah. it's like, you know, we can, like you said, we can fall from grace, but it would never be a definite fall from grace. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly because, the yeah. point. 
that's exactly the point that we we obviously sin. And a perfect example would be Lazarus. Um, he his he was brought back to life, but obviously he had lots of fabric that was stinky. So Lazarus, though he was alive, he stunk, and he had um, obviously uh, in the same way we are brought back to life, but we do have the sinful tendencies, and that's why it's so important synergism and monergism because if salvation is dependent upon you. You gather enough sin throughout the day to to not earn the salvation. You know, it, it's not by works; it's through grace, and that's the that's the key. That salvation is a work of God. It's monergistic. Therefore, anything that God does, He does it perfectly. Yeah, and yo, honestly, bro, if if the perseverance or the preservation of the saints wasn't true, and salvation was synergistic. Um, and if we could lose our salvation, if we like committed a mortal sin, that would be so depressing. Yeah. Because you think about Paul in Romans 7, he said, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? He said, the thing that I don't want to do is the very thing that I do. The thing that I do want to do is the very thing I don't do. So if we could lose our salvation, like John MacArthur said, we would. Yeah. If we could lose yeah. our salvation, we would, because we have to understand our own sinfulness, even as believers, um, yeah. Yeah. And we, that's we sin greatly. Yeah, and you made a great point because what can a dead man do? You know, um, can a dead man make decisions for himself? He's dead. You know, all he can do is think. And what did we do to be born? We did nothing to be physically born. And what did we do with the spiritual uh, birth? Did we do anything there? We do nothing, absolutely nothing. So the key is the monergistic work of God to understand the preservation of the saints. Let me read something to you from John Calvin on the Institutes. It's chapter 16, where he's talking about the, the providence of God and the governing of God through our creation. And he says this, he says, but whoever has been taught from the mouth of Christ that, that, that a hair of his head are all counted, will seek further for a cause and conclude that all, not some, all events are governed by the secret counsel of God. So in other words, God is governing the universe, right? Jesus is king. He, everything has been given to him. And right now, there's not a molecule. There's not a bacteria that it's outside of God's control in the creation, in, in the creation itself. Um, with salvation, it's the exact same. God is in control of everything. God is sovereign. And Jesus is our shepherd. And not, is, not only is he our shepherd, Samuel, he's the perfect shepherd. Mm. The, the, he will lose none. And that's why we're going to read, um, I think it's in John. John uh, 10. Let's see. Yep, let's go to John 10. John 10, 27 to 29. And I'll read it. It All says, right. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. That, that is something right there that we need to emphasize on. We will never perish because we are in the hands of a perfect pastor. And no one, no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. And this is something so interesting, and I love it. Because who are we, Samuel? We are the ones that the father has given to Jesus. And Jesus is saying, I'm not going to lose not one of them. And I am going to take them to heaven so they can see the glory that I share with you for all eternity. That is something so beautiful. And understanding that Jesus is the perfect shepherd. There's a story in the Old Testament. I was trying to dig it up earlier because it's a great illustration. In the Old Testament, we have a pattern where the most important characters in the Old Testament, right, they're highlighted with a great downfall. David for his sin. 
um, uh, Solomon for the lust. You know, we, th th there's always something wicked and twisted on these characters. Jacob mm -hmm. was uh, a trickster. And yeah. someone in the Old Testament, if I'm not mistaken, lost a sheep. You know, and Jesus never loses a sheep. You know, so he's our perfect uh, pastor. And we can rest assured that our preservation is going to go to the final completion, which is the glorification of our body. Yeah, I really love that. And let's <laughs> go back to the text. In, in John 10, he <laughs> says, um, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. That word, that phrase right there is very important too. It's eternal <sighs> life. Yes. If, if you can lose it, then that means it wasn't eternal to begin with. He didn't, yeah. he says he gives us eternal life at the moment where we are saved. It didn't say he will give us eternal life. We have yes. eternal life. Yes, sir. So if, if we lose salvation, then the, the eternal life he gave us wasn't really eternal life to begin with. It was temporary life. And then yes. let's keep on yes. going. And it says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. And the objection I hear to this is, yeah, no one can snatch you out of the father's hand. But if you choose to leave the father's hand, you have the free will to do so. I want to tell this to people who say that objection. You're included in that no one. When it says no one, it meant no one. Now, when you say that objection, you're adding to the text and you're saying no one except for me. But the text doesn't say that. The text says no one. So you are included okay. in that no one. If the father decides to save someone, that person will inherit the kingdom of God. And no one, including you, is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. And one thing I want to say before I forget is that this can go back to what we did two weeks ago, the unconditional election. Because if God, before yeah. the foundation of the world, chooses to save someone and chooses to give them eternal life and foreordains them to eternal life, then that person will be saved because God foreordained it. God decreed it before the foundation of the world. God decrees yeah. every event. Understand that. God decrees yeah. everything that is to occur. So if he decreed our salvation, that means he also decreed for us to enter the kingdom of God as well. So if unconditional election is Amen. true, the preservation of the saints has to be true. Exactly. And, you know, that, that's why I love the, the acronym of the TULIP, because James White will agree with me by saying that you cannot go to a debate. You cannot go to a conversation and try to define one of the letters without talking about the other, because they're so connected together. You back. know, I, that, that's something that I love. And as, as I was studying through this, I found myself going through the entire acronym for that reason, because it, it does yeah. blend in perfectly. But a definition, because I don't want to leave without giving a proper definition of perseverance. Um, but perseverance is the continuous operation of the Holy Spirit in the believer by which the work of divine grace that is begun in the heart is continued and brought to completion. I'm going to read it one more time. Perseverance is the continuous operation of the Holy Spirit in the believer by which the work of divine grace that has begun in the heart is continued and brought you to completion. You, you mentioned it earlier that the Holy Spirit is the seal, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, a, a good understanding of a seal, it's a seal that is, it goes in front of a letter, right? And you tear it up so you could read the, the information that's inside. Well, the Holy Spirit is a, an unbrokable bond, that, we're, that we have on earth until we go to be with the Father. And that's such a wonderful thing because the Holy Spirit, when he dwells in, in us, right? When, when, when the Holy Spirit truly dwells within a believer, that person is going to yield fruit. And not only that, but that person is going to go in a process of holiness. And that person will reach the triumphal conclusion that is the glorification of our bodies. And that is truly a, a motivating thing. Yeah, um, before we even continue, because um, the preservation of the saints and once saved, always saved is something I've been defending for so long. It's something I've been defending even before I was a Calvinist, my God, because I've okay. seen so many people distort it and not represent what we're really trying to say correctly. They straw man it and say, oh, so you're saying that you can live like a devil. That's not what we're saying. So I've been defending this for like almost a year now. 
And one of my favorite arguments is from John chapter six. And I think that if you say that once saved, always saved for the preservation of the saints is incorrect, I think you're making Jesus out to be a liar. And here's why. Because Jesus said in John chapter six, and I'm gonna start from verse 35. He said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Verse 37, all that the father, what gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me, I will, what? Circle the word, never cast out. Verse 38, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now let's stop right there because Jesus is telling us something very profound. He's telling us that the father sent him to do the father, his will. Now we know that Christ is someone who is perfect in nature. He never fails to do what he sets out to do. He is perfect. He is king. He is God in the flesh, God incarnate, the theoanthropist. So he will fulfill his mission. Okay. So he came down to do the will of the father, right? Verse 39. And this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that the Father has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of the Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So if you're saying that someone could lose their salvation, what you're saying is that Jesus is the biggest failure. Because he's come down to do the will of God. And the will of God is that those that the Father has given him, he will not lose any of them. So if he did lose any of them, Amen. that means he failed at doing the will of God. He failed at completing his mission. Amen. And that's true. Um, that, that's so true. If people think like that, they, they have to reach that conclusion. And another thing that we need to understand is that God has covered us and he has sealed us with his power. And that is so, I, I, I love when he says that because, you know, there's nothing in us that contributes to our justification and why do i keep bringing this back up because they, we have nothing in that that is a work of god and like you said you know what jesus does he does it perfectly there is nothing in jesus that he will make an error on does he save some or does he save all the ones that he that, that his father gave to him of course he does and he makes a clear distinction with jude he makes clear distinction with jude mm -hmm. um i mean yeah with this Yes, Father, I've, I've, I'm, I kept all the ones that you've given me, and he excludes uh, Judas for a reason. And then we see the same pattern in, in, in the first epistle of John, where John says, look, they were never part of us, just like Judas really never was, you know, uh, with Jesus. Now, we're not yeah. saying that he wasn't with Jesus. He was physically there. But does that mean that, that he had, uh, that he was saved? No. And another thing to understand is that that also applies to the church. The church is known as a, a mixed body, a corpus per mixtum. And that is simply saying that um, you have an entire church, right? And just because a person uh, goes to church every day, that doesn't mean that they're safe. That doesn't mean that they're regenerated, you know? And another beautiful example is the thief on the cross. The yeah. thief on the cross had nothing to contribute to his justification had nothing to contribute to his salvation. And right there, he was declared righteous. Mm -hmm. he, it, it's beautiful to understand that everything relies in the hands of God. And in Jesus Christ, God has set up a relationship between himself and his creatures, promised them to carry through his purpose in creation to his triumphal conclusion. God is going to be glorified and his purpose will be done. And the ones that the Father has given to Jesus Christ, guess what? They're, they're safe and they cannot lose Amen. their salvation. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. I love that, man. Yes, sir. Yeah, that is just so beautiful. Yeah. And I, yes, sir. I have a Bible verse that I want to read right now, and that is yeah. 1 Peter 1. Oh, I love this so much. 20, yeah, <laughs> me too. I had, I had to bring this one today. 1 Peter chapter 1 verses chapter verses 24 to 25 and it says one of my favorite yeah one second 
For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of the grass. Yeah. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And that same word is the one by which we are brought back to life and are to know Jesus Christ. And this is why our salvation, Samuel, is imperishable. It cannot perish because it comes from God. Yeah. And that's beautiful. Even if you go back to chapter, I mean, no, ch verse, verse three of first Peter chapter one, he says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Verse four says to obtain an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled mm -hmm. and unfading, kept in heaven mm -hmm. for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. He's saying you who have been born again to a living hope, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, you are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That's what you call the preservation of the saints. We are being yeah. guarded by God. We are being protected by God for the purpose of him saving us in the last time. Um, yes, that's sir. the preservation of the saints for you, you know? Amen. Yeah, and I think we wrapped it up pretty good um, because God is the author of our salvation. And I also want to lastly read Judas, uh, uh, Jude, I'm sorry, Jude chapter 1, verse 24 to 25. I think that's what I was trying to read earlier here. And it's a simple doxology, but it's so rich in detail yeah. about our, our preservation. And it says, um, verse 24, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only one, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now forever. Amen. I think that goes straight up with uh, chapter 16 of the Institute, that God governs everything and Jesus Christ is Lord. and our salvation is rested upon him. I love this. I love this doctrine yes, so much, bro. It just brings yeah. so much comfort because I know people who thought and still think that they could lose their salvation. And I see how much despair they're in because they're really trying to work and work and work to keep and maintain their salvation. Yeah. And if anyone, and, and, and I know genuine brothers and sisters in Christ who believe that you can lose your salvation. But there's, there's a line that you cross where it can become heretical because we believe that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So if you, someone can lose their salvation, that means you have to continuously do something to keep yeah. your salvation. And that just yes. brings despair to people and that it can be borderline heretical. And that can just, you know, make it seem like salvation depends on the person instead of God. So, and this is yes. why the doctrine is so beautiful and it brings comfort to the souls of many saints. I know it did for me because I used to think that you could lose salvation probably two years ago. And then when, yes. when it just clicked in my mind that my salvation depended not on me, but on God, who is my preserver and my keeper, like he said in Jude one twenty four. it just changed everything. And I had so much comfort and I started defending it like nothing else, bro. I started defending yeah. it left and right, and I hear yeah. people, you know, preach against it, and I was just like, yeah, yeah. I want to bring comfort to the church. Yeah, and honestly, there's no better feeling um, to only cling on the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, you know, one of the things that I that I had in 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 my life was that I would normally would look at what I do. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and I would look yeah. at um, the performance and yeah. then, um, for validation of my justification. And that's, that's erroneous because, um, it, it, it's based on the definite atonement of Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's based on what Christ has done. Um, it's about believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, truly believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it has nothing to do with my works. It has nothing to do with what I do. So what I do recommend to the people that are having a hard time to understand this doctrine is that you should um, 
you should look at justification as a work of God, okay? And you should see yourself not as a sick person that is struggling through life, makes good choices once in a while, and then falls back down. You have to see yourself as a person that is spiritually dead and unable to do any good unless God changes the disposition of your heart. That process, now that we say that, comes from God, and therefore he will finish it. And, and that is such a thing that gives you peace, makes your soul be still, understanding that our salvation rests in Christ. And I want to, to finish, and I want to go back to what you said about the law of gospel distinction. Where we understand that we shouldn't be looking at ourselves to the, for our assurance. We shouldn't be looking at ourselves to determine where we are going to go if, when we die or if Christ comes back. We should be looking upon the finished work of Christ because I'm going to bring Romans 7 back. Paul talks about the nature of sinful people, even as Christians. So if we're looking to, at ourselves, we are going to be in despair because we are wretched as sinners. We are sinners and we are justified at the same time. But if we look at ourselves, uh, we realize I'm going to hell. If I look at myself and I look at my own performance, I'm going to hell. But if I look at the finished work of Christ on the cross and trust in what he did and trust what he did alone and not what I'm doing, I'm going to have assurance because I'm not resting yes. in my own yes. self. I'm resting on someone who is perfect and not someone who is imperfect. Um, yes. So Yeah, yeah and, and it, creates, it creates a high, I mean, if you look at your works and you look at the demands of the law, um, you're going to be a really miserable person. Um, if you have the missing variable, which is what they normally have, um, and when I say the missing variable is that they're in their thinking, they're missing one thing that is so basic, and that is that Christ died for your sins, okay, and he was a perfect lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, and that is for the atonement of your sins, and there is nothing in there that you did, yeah. nothing. Nothing, nothing in yourself. So yeah, brother, that's the perseverance of the saints or the preservation of the saints. Um, and like I said, there are people who are straw manning this position. So if there's anyone you know who believes that you can lose their salvation, I encourage you to send this video to them. And also I'm going to put my brother Hector's um, social media in the description below. Go follow him, he has amazing content. Um, and we are planning uh, to do way more videos together with me and the other brothers the ref the reformers 2.0 you know what i'm talking about baby <laughs> but yeah Amen. sir but thank you for coming on my brother i love you so much man and yeah man thank you for coming on bro yeah the honor is mine and god to be the glory yes sir and if this is your first time watching i encourage you to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified every time i post another video like i said i'm here to help you love the scriptures and to reform back to the word of god i love you guys Amen. see you in the next video